I wanna start off with a segment that I like to call Love Letters from Kids. Love Letters from Kids. Now, full disclosure, we are retiring this segment this year. Yeah, because I gotta be creative. I can't just do the same thing for six years. So. But I love it so much, and we're gonna bring out some new ones, bring back some old ones. And the reason why I do it, by the way, is not just for some laughs, although they are hilarious. Um, I do it because there's one thing kids are, is honest. Kids do not know how to lie. They tell it how it is. Your breast stinks. They'll say it. They don't care. <laughs> and we all need a little more honesty in our relationships. And we all need a little more honesty in the self-evaluation of our relationships and us in that relationship. So we're going to start off with our first letter, which you know, before you had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you had mom and dad. Mom and dad was the first one that you loved. So here's a love letter for mom. Dear mom, thank you so much for being my mom. If I had a different mom, I would punch her in the face and go find you. I would, because you're the best mom. I'll go find you, mom. <laughs> go ahead, Brooke. She don't play no games. The next letter's to dad. Next letter's to dad. Love you, dad. Dear dad, I'm so glad that me and Isaac are staying with you. Me and Isaac miss you. I hope you and mom will get back together, but you and mom won't, because my mom does not like you. <laughs> Sorry, dad. Missed a shot. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. This one was written almost, uh, almost exactly 11 years ago, February 14, 2012. Dear Wendy, I know, you see how he wrote no and no, I know this is weird, but I like you so much. And I didn't want to tell you because you would just hit me in the middle. <laughs> just like you hit me last time. <laughs> I got you something for you. I hope you like it. If you had liked me, I will take care, care, care of you. If you have a boyfriend and that's fine, I will not be sad. I will buy you whatever you want. Even 100 pairs of shoes, too. <laughs> I hope you have a great Valentine's Day. Love, Julian. Hey, and for every guy in the room today or watching online, there is a Julian inside of all of us. <laughs> you don't like me? I'll buy you 100 shoes. <laughs> you like me? No? Next one. This is why some of us are still in therapy after, after grade school right here, because we dated people like Stevie, okay? Dear Keenan, I'm sorry, we have to break up. You always try to make me laugh, but you're just making yourself look bad. <laughs> We're over. For real from Stevie. And what gets me is the scratch through love. You couldn't just rewrite the letter? It only, it's only 11 words. You had to let him know? Nah, I don't love. <laughs> love, scratch that, from. That's why we're still in therapy right now. This one is a little, a little older, a little more mature. This is like an eighth grade love letter. But are you ready to be there when I'm mad or need to cry and I can do things that I can't do with anyone else but you with? Yes, I am ready unless I'm eating fried chicken. <laughs> so chicken is more important than me? Only fried chicken. <laughs> and, and, only, and only when I'm hungry. But if not, then you're the only thing I care about, girl. You're the only thing I care about. Good. <laughs> And this, this last one, this last one's actually very, very cute and, uh, and very good. This one is from Emma, Emma K, age six. Love is when you're missing some of your teeth, but you're not afraid to smile because you know your friends will still love you even though some of you is missing. Isn't that cute? And listen, and now I'm gonna transition into preaching because we gotta be honest. I don't care where you are on the spectrum of relationships. Single, married, engaged, divorced, got somebody, ain't got somebody, things are going good, things are going bad. If we're being honest, no matter our relationship status, there comes a moment where we all feel like something is missing. And so I'm gonna need you 
to be honest today. In order for God's word to take root in your heart, you're gonna have to be real. And so I'm gonna talk to different people throughout this series. First off, raise your hand if you're single, be honest. Now be honest if you're single. Don't be like, I'm married to Jesus. No. <laughs> Do you date somebody? No, raise your hand. Come on, keep it up. This is what you're working with, church. <laughs> this is what you're working with in case you're single. Look around, we got a lot of options. All right, she stood up. <laughs> That's funny. If you don't like what you see, we got three services and two campuses, okay? Go somewhere else, they'll be there. All right, now, now ready? Now be honest, how many of y'all are single and content? Be honest. Somebody's like, nope. Other people are like, yeah, I'm single, I'm content. That's awesome, but now be honest. Listen, I'm glad if you're single and content. The Bible talks about that. It actually talks about some of us being called to singleness and God fulfilling that need. That's awesome. But before you say, yeah, I'm good being single and content, let me follow that up with a question. Be honest. Are you single and content because God called you to that? Or are you single and content because someone hurts you and you've given up on love? Wow. Ouch. <laughs> and be honest. Ouch. Raise your hand if you're dating. Raise your hand if you're dating. Right. <laughs> Somebody's hand is halfway up. We're like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> We haven't DTR'd, we haven't DTR'd. We haven't DTR'd to find the relationship, in case you know what that is. Yeah, yeah. So I know the youth words. Yeah, all right, now, now be honest, does that person add value to your life or drama to your life? And be honest. And now with me, be honest with yourself. It's always a bad sign when I meet you in the lobby and you're trying to convince me he's good for you. That's a bad sign. I meet people in the lobby all the time. They're like, Pastor, I'm dating this person, and I don't know. Before they get, he's so great. He loves Jesus. He's so great. He comes to church. He's awesome. He go, I go, what's the problem? He go, well, he got a record. <laughs> it's his fifth marriage. I think he does drugs. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He's like, but he loves Jesus. He owns like three cross jewelry pieces. <laughs> I really think he's, he's in it. I don't think I'm the one that needs convincing here. It sounds like, sounds like you do. Okay, be honest. This is a good one. Raise your hand if you're engaged. Anybody engaged? Come on. Hey, my man right there. Any more people engaged in the house? Okay, we got some in the back. Okay. Now listen, are you really engaged? Be honest. What do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean really engaged? I mean, did he buy you a ring and y'all got a date on the calendar? Because there's levels of engaged. I have discovered. How long have you been engaged? Five years. <laughs> then you ask them why, and it's always the same answer. I can't understand. I'm trying to save up. <laughs> For what? I don't understand. I did the research. I went to the Orange County website. A marriage license is $86. <laughs> if you want the judge to do the ceremony, that's $30. And if you use a credit card, that's a 350 surcharge. <laughs> Homie, if you ain't got 119.50, I'll spot you. <laughs> I got you. I could do 119. Or you could just come to church, we'll do the marriage for free right here. It's all good. We'll make it happen. <laughs> Somebody just lost their only excuse <laughs> right now. She just elbowed him, said, he said he'd do it for free. And if money's not the problem, then what is? Be honest. Married. Raise your hand if you're married. How many people married? Awesome. How's that going? <laughs> and be honest. Sometimes it's going great, and we're still afraid. Because when it's going great, we remember the times it wasn't going great. And a little piece of us is afraid that we're going to end up back there, thinking that we got past things that we didn't get past. We just got over but not really through, so that season didn't really get to do in our marriage what it needed to do because we rushed on to the next thing. Other times, you know, we're married and it's not going great and everybody knows it. We're not even living together anymore. And it's a challenge and it's a, but be honest, because that's the only way that it works. Here's a category of people that are here today. Those who are not just single, but they're single again. That's tough. And I'm not just talking about you broke up with him, he broke up with you, uh, she broke up with you. I I'm talking about those who, have had to go through the um, trauma of divorce and the trauma of death. Those who are now widowers or have been widowed. And 
the pain of losing someone, if you're honest, how are you? I know that there's a part of you that wants to hope and wants to believe you'll find love again. But if we're being honest, I think there's another part of us that wonders, why go through all that work if I'm just gonna be hurt again? It might be safer just to stay where I am if we're being honest. And if you'll be honest with yourself, and if you'll be honest with me, and if we'll all be honest with God, I can be honest with you. I wanna be honest with you. When we called this series Before and After, I was inspired by those um, infomercials with the exercise equipment that you watch late at night. <laughs> Have you ever seen those? The ones that's like plug a battery to your chest and you'll get six pack abs and like six weeks, ever seen that stuff? And I always loved one of their selling tactics. They would take the before picture and they would take the after picture and they put the after picture real close to the before picture. And they're like, if you buy this, you can look like this. And I think that's really cool. The promise of after. So I'm gonna pull a page from that book and I wanna say, listen, I don't know where you are in your relationship status. I don't know how healthy or how hurt or how much you wanna grow, but I wanna make a promise to you today. If you lean into God's word over the next four weeks, if you put in the work, if you ask God to do what only God can do, there is an after season for your relationship. You're not gonna stay where you are. It's not gonna be like that. You're not gonna stay empty. You're not gonna stay broken. You're not gonna stay lonely. You're not gonna stay hurting. There is an after promise in the word of God for your marriage, for your husband, for your wife, for your boyfriend, for that future someone. There's, a, there's an after promise, but I also want to do what I wish they would do in the infomercial. Don't just show me the before picture. And don't just show me the after picture. Because before is where I am, and after is where I want to go. But there was something that happened in between. And I need you to tell me what happened in between. Because if you don't tell me what happened in between, I don't know if I'm willing to go through what happens in between to get to the promise of after. And there's always an in between. And so I make a promise for the after of your life. But I'm going to be honest about the in-between. Today's message in the series before and after is called the in-between. The in-between. Because there is an in-between season of our relationships. And I want to look at a woman in the Bible who gets very little love. We don't preach about her a lot. In fact, she gets very little love literally. And her name is Leah. Now, the word Leah means weary. So before we even get into her life story, you can have a picture of kind of what her life is like. It's exhausting. She's tired. Because it's exhausting being single for a long time, not knowing when your person's coming. It's exhausting arguing with your spouse over the same things for years and years. It's exhausting being single again, separated, divorced, widowed, hoping, believing that God's going to do something. It can be exhausting. The in-between is very exhausting. But here's my first point. What are we going to have to go in-between? Well, in between, alone and loved is loneliness. Nobody wants to talk about that. It's not exciting. It's not encouraging. But loneliness is a season you are going to have to walk through if you want to get too loved. The story goes like this in Genesis chapter 29, verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. Look at verse 17. This is so messed up. And there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes. Dang. I don't know how else to say this, y'all, but from my job is to make Jesus accessible. So I'm just going ahead and translate this for you. Leah was busted. <laughs> she was not pretty. And you know you ugly when the Bible say you ugly. Like the Bible is the most encouraging book in the whole world. And the Bible said you ugly. Like while Moses was writing the Bible, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit tapped him on the shoulder when he got to this part and was like, hey. <laughs> and make sure they know. <laughs> she was not good looking. Add that in there. How specific you want me to get? Her eye, it's all about her eyes. She was a little sweaty in there. That's messed up. At first, I got offended for Leah. I was like, dang, Bible, why are you going to do Leah like that? Forever being known in the Bible for, what did it say? For no sparkle. <laughs> why are you going to do her like that? But then I remembered that every detail in the Bible comes with intention. So then I thought, maybe the Bible needed to portray her as the ugliest person to encourage all those who feel ugly that come after her. 
You might think, well, well, beautiful people don't feel ugly. I've met beautiful people. I've talked to beautiful people. I've counseled beautiful people. Here's what you don't know about beautiful people. Even beautiful people feel ugly on the inside. Insecurity has nothing to do with your highlights. Insecurity has nothing to do with your weight. You can be the perfect weight and still not feel attractive. And God is about to give us a story with Leah. Lord, forgive me. I mean, you said it, not me. The most busted of the busted. Hear me. To encourage anybody that feels busted, that you're not too busted for God, and you're not too busted for love. And the plan that he's going to do in Leah's life, he's going to do it in your life. He's going to do it in your life. And now Leah didn't have TikTok or Instagram or social media to compare herself with. That's the problem that this generation faces. They don't think they're beautiful because they're looking at people that have been photoshopped and filtered and all these things. But she does have a sister, and she's wrestling with comparison because Rachel, the Bible says, had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. Hey, Rachel had it going on. Rachel was fine. Verse 18, since Jacob was in love with Rachel, he told her father, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. And, and, and we ought to get convicted right there in that moment because Jacob was willing to wait seven years and some of us can't wait seven months. Verse 22, and I'm getting the, the SpongeBob in my head. Seven years later, that's what I hear in my head. <laughs> seven years later. We're getting fast forward now, fast forwarding in time, seven years of work. Now we're in verse 22. So Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. Ooh, you're about to get twisted right now. But that night when it was dark, notice the details, Laban took Leah to Jacob and he slept with her. But when Jacob woke up in the morning, dot, 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 it was Leah. Now, I love the Bible so much. It's so real. Because at this point is when all of the biblical skeptics come out of the woodworks and say, this is how I know the Bible's not true. Because how in the world could you sleep with somebody and not know who you're sleeping with? That's all the critics. And well, first off, you have to understand the historical, cultural, technological context of that time, as in the sense that Thomas Edison had not yet invented the light bulb. <laughs> They're in the middle of the woods in a tent, okay? It's dark. On top of that, when the bride got married, she had a veil on. So for all intents and purposes, she thought that she was Rachel. Secondly, before you start judging Jacob, don't act like you ain't never woke up next to somebody. Huh? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. They look good in the club. (laughs) Then you woke up the next day. Leah! (laughs) What the... And it wasn't even darkness and a veil. It was alcohol and a strobe light. Yeah. That's why they make the club dark, by the way. So you can take it home at night and have to pay for it in the morning. Okay. Are we all on the same page that it can happen now? No, okay. Now that we're past that, it can happen because it happened to me, right? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Verse 25. He looks at his father-in-law. And says, what have you done to me, Jacob, raged at Laban. He's so mad at Laban. But maybe get to know somebody before you sleep with them. Then he wouldn't have had this problem if he would have had one conversation. I swear I'm not judging. I'm helping. It just feels that way. Because we got problems. (laughs) I worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? And now verse 26, and I've never read verse 26 in this context before, and it really hit me because the way I was taught about Laban, Pastor David, and the Bible was that Laban was deceptive, and he was a trickster, and he was a liar. But as a good father, you can relate to this. What if Laban, when he promised Rachel to Jacob, that was seven years ago. The custom is for the older to get married before the younger. So maybe when he promised Rachel, he was under the assumption that surely in the next seven years, someone will come looking for Leah. <laughs> but, but seven years came, and seven years went, and no one came looking for Leah. Which then begs us to ask the next question. 
because we don't have a lot of detail about Leia other than the sparkly eye thing, is this. Single for seven years, nobody came. And, and this was about a time when, when fathers would give you dowries for marrying their kids. You, 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 you can't get married in seven years. And this is the question we start asking, what's wrong with Leia? And for all my single people in the room, there comes a point where you get single long enough and you start asking that question about yourself. What's wrong with me that I don't have somebody in my life yet? Am I not tall enough? Am I not strong enough? Am I not fast enough? Is my bra size not big enough? Is my wallet not fat enough? Am I too broken for love? What's wrong with me? And loneliness is so painful because it's not just a feeling that hurts. Hear me, it's a question that haunts. Every time you hear a love song on the radio and you're not, you're not with somebody, what's wrong with me? Every time you watch a rom-com on TV and you're not with somebody, what's wrong with me? Every time you get to Disney World and there's a single rider line on the roller coaster, <laughs> you're not complaining, but at the same time, you're like, what's wrong with me? And I want to pivot here because I want to just talk to single people. I want to talk to married people because I think, and people who are dating, because I think one of the greatest misconceptions is that, well, once you get married, you stop being lonely. That's a lie. Look what happens in verse 27, Genesis 29, 27. But wait until the bridal week is over, Laban says to Jacob, and then we'll give you Rachel too, provided you promise to work another seven years for me. Verse 28, so Jacob agreed to work seven more years a week after Jacob had married Leah. Laban gave him Rachel too. I don't know how long the honeymoon phase of your marriage lasted. 10 months, 10 years. For Leah, it lasted seven days. After that, look at verse 30. So Jacob slept with Rachel too, and he loved her much more than Leah. So now she's in a relationship with no love. And it's one thing to feel alone when you ain't got nobody, but it's another thing to feel alone and you share the same bed as somebody. Oh my God. You, you, you're more roommates than romance. You rarely talk, you rarely kiss. You find excuses to not be with each other. You stay, out, you stay at the office late. She's out running errands late. He's out running errands late. You come home, but one of y'all stays up watching TV while the other one goes to bed, huh? You're both at the dinner table, but you're both on your phones, not conversating. What happened and why does that happen? I think it happens for a lot of reasons. I think just the stresses of life. You got teenagers and kids and babies and they all require things. You got to take them places. You got to do stuff. You got to provide for stuff. And if you're not careful, you can be more like business partners than family. You take care of this. I'll take care of that. Let's delegate. Or maybe it's the trauma that happens in relationships sometimes, like you lose a job or a loved one or you can't get pregnant. That weight that that puts on the husband and the wife, whatever the pain may be, I think whatever it is, whether you're single or whether you're in a relationship or somewhere in between, I think the real problem, listen, is mistaken expectation. Not unrealistic expectation. Unrealistic expectation is for another message. I mean, like, we got it all wrong altogether. And the way we got it wrong is that when you're single, you think the following. If I could just find the right person, then I'll be happy. But then you find that person, and issues come up, and then all of a sudden the sentence changes. If that person can just get right, then I'll be happy. But then they don't get right. And then the sentence changes again. If I can just get out, then I'll be happy. And it's a mistaken expectation. Write this down if you're taking notes. Put it on the screen. Because if you feel lonely before you find someone, you will feel lonely after you find someone. Because your loneliness has nothing to do with the other person. We think it does though, because this is the image of love that we're sold on all of the multi-million dollar making movies. You know, Jerry Maguire, you complete me. That, that we are a picture that is missing the piece and that somewhere in the world, God has cut someone out who can fit right into the area of your heart that you are missing. Yeah, and we have a word for that person. We call them the one. And we learn about them in school and we learn about them through movies. By the way, the concept of the one does not come from the Bible. It comes from Greek mythology. And I don't believe in it. 
I don't think it makes sense. The one. I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios why this is bad and why this doesn't make sense. Number one, if there really is the one, just one piece for me, that fits me, what happens if that one gets all disobedient and decides not to marry me and marry somebody else? If Liz is my one, that's because she decided to follow God and she obeyed God. She obeyed God when she married me. <laughs> but what if she had done something wild in her 20s and decided, you know what? I'm not going to marry JJ. I'm going to marry Earl. Earl the elephant. <laughs> Earl, get it? Okay, it's a little late. Well, now that's messed up because you were not the one for Earl. So now you messed me up because now I'm going to end up with somebody who's not for me. You just took somebody else's spot. One day we're going to have zebras sleeping with ostriches. And the whole plan, God's whole plan for the world is jacked up because one person missed their person. That don't make no sense. Secondly, I don't think you want to give one person that much power. If you're missing a piece and that person holds the piece of your heart, you're telling me you're putting all your identity, all your hope, all your peace in the hands of a person? Have you ever met a person? People are crazy. You ever been in a relationship with someone who's crazy? This is how it feels. Ah! <laughs> you don't know what day it's going to be like ups and downs. Ups and downs. Do you want to have that kind of relationship? You ever, you, or what if that person decides to cheat on you and gives your heart to someone else? Or steps on your heart? What if that person dies and takes your heart with them to the grave? What then? Not only that, the logic all falls apart. Because hear me, this is the real issue. If we are all pictures missing our pieces, right? Then, then another person could never fill me. Why? Because then that would mean that they too. Uh-huh, right? If this is how all people are, then that means he's like that too. She's like that too. And now you got two people who are missing pieces trying to complete each other, then the worst thing that can happen is that these two get married. Because you won't be able to put a language on it. You won't be able to explain it. But one day you can look at that person and you go, something's not working. Something's not fitting. It's like we're forcing it. You are. Because you're asking someone to be something they were not created to be. There's no one on this planet I have to rebuild this. <laughs> Good thing it's a children's puzzle. James, come rebuild this right now. <laughs> Here are the pieces. Go ahead, bro. I think that's the lion's face right there. You got 10 seconds. I think this one goes there and this one goes there. Go ahead. You got it. And this is a foot oh, right it. there. That's a tiger. Get rid of the tiger. Awesome. So you miss all the pieces? You got all the pieces. Great. Everybody's watching you, bro. Get it, make it happen. <laughs> There's no one on this planet that can fill that void. And, but, but okay, this is where loneliness comes. Loneliness is a teacher if you'll let it teach. Some people won't stay alone long enough. Some people won't be alone or single long enough to let loneliness do its job. Loneliness is in your life to teach you something. Way to go, bro. Give it up for James. Hey, but now I need that piece. Where's that piece? Oh, it's in my pocket. Okay. If you, if you let, if you embrace loneliness, loneliness will teach you it's not working. I've tried with people. I've tried it. Nothing is fitting. God, what is the problem? Because loneliness is telling you that the problem isn't the peace. It's that you got the formula reversed. You think you're a picture looking for your peace. But if you stay alone long enough, loneliness will teach you that that is not the case. That in fact, you are the peace missing the big picture. Ooh, that's good. Because the Bible, the Bible does not teach us that we're missing. The Bible teaches us that we're lost. 
we're apart, we're broken, we're, 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 we don't have no purpose, we're not connected, that's bad news. Here's the good news. The Bible also teaches us that 2,000 years ago, God put on flesh to come to earth to seek and save that which is lost. The ones who had no connection, the ones who were alone, and to connect them to the big picture that is Jesus Christ. Now you know why I picked a lion. This is what loneliness teaches us. Write this down if you're taking notes. Put it on the screen. The lesson of loneliness is to stop looking for the one that was created for you and to start looking to the one you were created for. You were created for. You were created for. You know you were created for more than just kissing. So why is our whole life revolving around another person? You know you were hewed for more than just hugs. So why is your life revolving around a whole other person? You know you were shaped for more than just shacking. So why is your life revolving around someone else? You have an eternal place on this planet. You have an eternal purpose on this earth. God's got something for you when you connect to him that you can't find in anyone else. Now let me help you out, single people. This is how it works if you're single, okay? If you're single, you don't gotta worry about the other pieces of the puzzle. All you gotta do is connect to your purpose. Because when you connect to your purpose, even if the other person doesn't come, all your needs are still met. Wow. This is how I met Pastor Liz. We were at a young adults retreat. She calls it a single conference. I say, don't say that. That makes us sound so thirsty. <laughs> we had a singles conference. It's not Christian speed dating. It was a, serv- a group of services where young adults went as well as those who were not in relationships. <laughs> That's what that was. And I showed up to that event because I was putting on the event. I was the leader of that event. I wasn't trying to look for my person. I was connected to my, Uh uh-huh. She showed up because she was leading a young adults group from her church. So she brought her group to the same event. She wasn't looking for a person. She was connecting to her. If you look for the person, you'll miss the person. If you connect to the purpose, the person will come. But if you try to connect to the person, so goes the person, so goes you. But if you connect to your person, to your purpose, with or without the person, you're still straight. With or without the person, you're still good. Let me translate this now for married folks. Listen, I remember um, early on, well, about halfway through our marriage, it was one of those days I woke up, I don't know how else to say it. We had gotten in a bad fight in New York City over a camera. It was so silly. But you know how it is in marriage. It's not the, it's not the one silly thing. It's the little things over nine, 10 years that added up. And it was that moment I woke up after that fight and for the first time in all of the years of us being married, I woke up and I'm ashamed to say it, but it's just the reality and maybe some couples can relate. I woke up and I was not feeling in love with my wife. I didn't have those butterflies that I had the first couple of years. I didn't see myself, I wasn't excited to, be, to wake up in that bed. I actually thought for the first time what it could be like to be with someone else. I thought this might just, I don't know, this is going to make it. And that feeling scared me so much that I got on my knees and I started praying. And I said, Lord, if you don't do something, I think this is going to be over. And as I started to pray, I started to think about the Lord. And I started to think about all the times that he loved me when he probably wasn't feeling it. I think about all the times I betrayed him and turned my back on him. I think all the times I left him, all the times I said that I would do something and then I didn't do it. And not only did he stay with me, are you ready? He anointed me. What? Not only did I stay with me, he blessed me. What? Not only did he bless me, he called me. What? And when I saw how he served me without the feeling, I said, well, Lord, if you serve me without the feeling, then I'm going to serve her without the feeling, not because I was feeling her, but because I was connected to him. See, if both of you are not connected to something greater, then when your life shakes, eventually the pieces drop. But when you are connected to something bigger than yourself. So I started serving, I started cleaning, I started cooking. You know what's serious when you start squeegeeing the shower. (laughs) That was me, I was doing it all. And one day I woke up and guess what? The love had come back. The feeling had come back because I was connected to Christ. Then fast forward a couple years later, I come out with my addiction and my struggle. I look at my wife, I tell her, hey, I've been going through this and 
and I'm sorry, I never told you. And, and she, I said, well, you forgive me. And she looked at me and she said two things. The first thing she said was, I'm so sorry that you've been holding that, that you had to hold that all these years. The second thing she said was, I forgive you. I don't know what made her say that. I think it was the fact that we were in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting. <laughs> to God be the glory. But when I asked her years later about that moment, she said, it was hard, but what made it easier was when I thought about all the times God had forgiven me. I thought about all the times he had erased my transgression, my pain, and allowed me to have a fresh start. And I thought, if he did that for me, how could I not do that for you? It wasn't the fact that she was connected to me, but the fact that she was connected to Christ, and I was connected to Christ, and our connection to Christ kept us connected to each other. That's how it works. For those who are single again, for those who are divorced, or for those who are widows, it can be real hard when somebody leaves your life because it feels like a part of you is missing. You ever lost a piece of a puzzle before? I did. It was a thousand piece puzzle, Yoda. And I was missing the piece right in the middle. So I said, nah, I'm gonna call it the manufacturer. So I got a hold of the manufacturer. I said, I'm missing a the piece. They said, which one? I was like, reddish brown. <laughs> it's in the middle. They said, no, sir, you gotta give me coordinates. I was like, what do you mean? He said, if you count up the side of the puzzle, and you go across C8, B9. I was like, y'all do that? He's like, yeah. I was like, it's C9. C9, said, you're missing C9? I said, yeah, I'm missing C9. He said, no problem. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take all the pieces of the puzzle and put them in the box. <laughs> Pull all the pieces in the box, send it back, and I'll send you, we'll send you a brand new box. <laughs> I said, huh? They say, yeah, we'll give you all the, all the pieces brand new again. I said, well, I don't want to start over. I put a lot of time into that. I put a lot of, a lot of money into that. A lot of vacations into that. There's a lot of tears into that. And then they're just gone. I don't want to start over. That's hard. But the beauty of starting over is that starting over is the evidence that it's not over. And what you thought could never be rebuilt, God has the power to restore once again when you stay connected to the manufacturer, connected to the creator. I love the fact that God restores. This is the part of my sermon I never got to preach in the first two messages. I love the fact that God restores and there's one step in between restoration and where you are today, because you can go either way. God can restore or you can just keep repeating the same old patterns that bring you back. But in between repetition and restoration is rejection. Rejection is the last piece of the puzzle when it comes to restoration. It's something you're gonna have to go through. It's something that Leah had to go through. Genesis 30, 29, 31 through 32. When God realized that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb but Rachel was barren, and Leah became pregnant and had a son, and she named him Reuben, which means, look, it's a boy. This is a sign, she said, that God has seen my ministry, and this next sentence breaks my heart to pieces. Surely my husband will love me now. Oh, poor Leah, 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 Leah. And the reason why my heart got sad is because I could hear teenage girls all over the world. Maybe if I give him my body, he'll love me now. I heard other women in relationships, maybe if I do that position that he likes, that makes me feel like more of an object than a person, but maybe then, maybe then he'll love me. Oh, I heard men all over the world. Maybe if I get her the diamonds, if I buy her the house, if I get her the car, maybe then, She'll love me. I heard adult women all over the world, maybe if I get implants, if I tuck the tummy, if I lift the butt, then maybe then he'll love me. I heard men all over the world, maybe if I hit the gym, make CEO, maybe if I get her pregnant, then she'll love me. And I just wanna save you all the time and all the money and all the heartache. There is nothing you can do that can make another person love you. 
Leia has six boys and one daughter named Dina. Rachel just had two kids and Jacob stayed loving Rachel. She outproduced him, but it didn't matter. And so she gets into a cycle of repetition, baby after baby after baby, trying to earn love, trying to earn love, trying to earn love. Look at verse 33. So she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord has heard that I'm not loved. Her focus is on her rejection. He gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon, still feeling empty. Verse 34, again she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband, now she's focused on her husband, will become attached to me. Maybe this time, because I've born him three sons. So he was named Levi. But baby after baby after baby, think of it this way, man after man after man. Nothing, nothing, nothing. But on the fourth baby, she changed her tune. Sometimes you got to go through a couple of Rubens. Sometimes you got to go through a couple of Simeons. Sometimes you got to go through a couple of Levi's, Sarah's, Tom and Jerry's. Sometimes you got to be in the relationship for a couple months, years, until you realize what Leah had to realize, that there isn't a man or woman on this planet that can fulfill your needs. So in verse 35, she gave birth once more, but this time was different. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, mm, this time, whew, I just believe February 5th, that's today, is somebody's this time. Put the verse back on the screen. This time, this time, she said, I'm not going to focus on my rejection. This time, I'm not going to focus on my loveless husband and marriage. I'm going to stop complaining about her, stop complaining about him this time. I will praise the Lord. Woo. And so she named him Judah, which means praise. Judah, who would become the father of David, who would become the father of our Messiah named Jesus. After rejected, Jesus who would be rejected. <sighs> like Leah was rejected. The, the Jesus who would be rejected, who would go on to die for the sins of the earth. That Judah comes out of rejection. And it's that Judah, how she overcomes rejection with stopping focusing on him and her and me and starts focusing on him. And then look at verse 35. I thought verse 35 was a curse. It's not, it's a blessing. Then she stopped having children. See, if you don't know, you go, you go what did she do wrong? Then she stopped having kids, but you missed the revelation. The reason why she stopped having kids is because she didn't need them anymore to be fulfilled. That's good preaching. The Lord was like, you want more kids? She was like, nah, I'm good. I got you. And if I got you, I don't need another boy. I don't need another girl. I don't need another man. I don't need another lady. I don't need another job. I don't need another this. I don't need another that. You can stop now. You're enough for me, Jesus. You got everything that I need. I ain't going to run nowhere else but to you. And so I'm going to praise you. Hey, are you alone? Praise the Lord. Are you rejected? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me help you really quickly. If you're afraid that that person's not coming, praise the Lord. Why? Because Jesus already came. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Are you afraid that they're gonna leave you? Praise the Lord, why? Because Jesus will never leave you. Deuteronomy 31, 8, put it on the screen. The Lord goes before you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Are they not meeting your needs? Praise the Lord. Why? Because the Bible says God will be all of your needs. And this same God, Philippians 4, 19, put it on the screen, who takes care of me, will supply all your needs according to his riches. Is there no peace in your marriage right now? Why? Praise the Lord. Why? Because you got peace that comes from another place. Verse 17, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. If they die and you don't have them in your life anymore, praise God. Why? Because you know one day you're going to see them again. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 14. Brothers and sisters, don't be uninformed. Those who sleep in death, don't cry like the rest of them. For we know that those who die will rise again. We're going to be with the people we love one day. Hey, and if they tell you, and if they tell you that they don't love you no more, praise God. 
Why? Because Romans 8.35 says this, put on the screen, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, angels, nor demons, fears for today, worries for tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky, above, or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Lord, our Lord. Would everybody stand across this room as I close really quickly? If you haven't gotten it yet, praise is how you get past rejection. Praise is how you get past loneliness. I don't care if you got the finest wife in the world. She's not gonna be enough for you, bro. Not unless you learn to praise. I don't care if you got the richest husband in the world. He ain't gonna be a love for you, ma'am. Not if you don't know how to praise. Look at, look at this, Genesis 30, one through two. Rachel didn't get it. Rachel didn't understand it. So Rachel looks at Jacob and she gets mad. She goes, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Look what Jacob says to her. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Now listen, what he's saying to Rachel is, why are you coming to me to get something only God can give? And this, somebody came to church to hear this. This is gonna save a marriage right now. Listen, Jacob's looking at Rachel and he's saying this, you're mad at the wrong person. I didn't expect a lot of amens because I know he's not perfect. And I know she did you dirty. But the reason why you're mad at the wrong person is because you put expectation on them <sighs> that only God can fulfill. You, you are mad at the wrong person. Take it to God. Take it to God. Take it to God. And don't feel bad for all, <laughs> for no sparkly eye layer. Don't feel bad because you know how her story ends? Verse 29, Jacob's about to die. He's on his bed, he's got 12 of his kids around him. That's how I wanna go, surrounded by my family. He gives them instructions. Then he gave them instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. He tells his kids, here's how I wanna go when I go. Bury me with my fathers in the cave, in the field of Ephraim the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah, near Mamre in Canaan, you know the one, where grandpa and great grandpa are, born, are buried them which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. Next verse, next verse, verse 31. There Abraham and his wife, Sarah, your, your, your great grandparents were buried there. There Isaac and Rebecca, were, your grandparents were buried there. And there I buried Rachel, right? No. Surely Rachel. No. Rachel was the one that he loved. No. Uh, how is that even possible? And there I buried Leah. When Rachel died, she got buried on the side of the road because she died far from home in a grave by herself. Leah got buried with the patriarchs of the faith. You know what God said? God said, even if he don't love you. Even if he never comes around, I want you to know I will honor you. I will exalt you. I will fulfill you. I will be your strength. Don't worry about him. He don't have the ability to lift you up. I lift you up. He ain't got the ability to provide for you. I'll provide for you. He ain't got the ability to be your strength. I'll be your strength. Because in the end, in the end, in the end, put it on the screen. In the end, nothing can stand in between you and God. Not no hell, not no devil, not no demon, not no ex-husband, ex-wife. Not no boyfriend, not no girlfriend, not no father, not no mother, not no insecurity, not no worry, not no fear, not no doubt, not no pain. Nothing can stand in the way, not in between. Hey, single people, if you make God the focus of your life, in the end, he will bring the person. And even if he don't, you still got him. Married people, 
You're going through it right now. I promise you, if you make God the focus in the end, he will grow it, he will restore it, he will bless it. Single again, divorced and widowed, I promise you, you make God your focus and in the end, he will heal and he will renew because he's a good God in the end. If you're willing to go through the in-between. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray for those who are going through it right now. The in-between right now. You feel alone and you're married. You feel alone and you're single. You feel alone and, and, and you ain't got no hope. You, you're feeling rejected. You're feeling broken. You're feeling empty. You're feeling like you ain't got no recourse or no way. Let me encourage you. Jesus is in the room today. If you're already a Christian, this is your moment to rededicate. Make that vow one more time. I know you love your wife, but you need to just tell the Lord today, I love her, Lord. But today I want to remind my soul, I love you more because I need you more. I need you to be the foundation that holds all things together, Jesus. Be my strength, be my rock. As you're talking to the Lord, I want to speak to another group of people. I want to speak to those who are not Christians. You have no relationship with Jesus. You got a mailer. You were invited to church. You had no idea what you were expecting. You had no idea what you would step into. But something inside of you was telling you, not only is God real, but he loves me. You got set up on a blind date and you didn't even know it. And today is the day where you make him the lover of your soul and the Lord of your life. It's time to stop looking for missing pieces, Journey Church. And it's time to realize that you're a piece of a bigger picture called Christ. If that's you, on three, you want Jesus in your heart. I want you to raise your right hand high to the sky, online and all over our campuses. On three, I need Jesus. Right hand, one, two, three. Right now, high, high, all over. So many hands. Come on, I know that there's hands on overflow right now. Hands being raised. If you raise your hand, even if you didn't, worship team, repeat this prayer out with me. Everyone all over the room, Father God, I'm not missing. I'm lost. But today I heard you seek and save that which is lost. Come, Lord, forgive me for my past. Prepare me for my future. I'm coming home today. I'm getting connected to the bigger picture, which is you, Jesus. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you put your hands together for all of those who made a decision? Welcome home. Hey, we're JJ and Liz Vasquez, and we wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. Maybe today you made the decision to follow Jesus. We want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is text JOURNEY to 55498. We would love to walk this journey out alongside you. Hey, don't let the journey stop there. We love for you to do one of three things. Either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all. Subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Be blessed.